eight line. Chapter one. First Timothy. Chapter one. If you don't have a Bible, grab one, make sure that you do have a copy of the scripture. A simple message this evening. And um, I want to read verses 11 through 15. This is Paul writing to Timothy, one he called or considered a son in the faith, and one who he was passing the baton to with regard to ministry. And the charge is that he's committing him or to help him to a very, very clear direction and focus as he carries on. One of the things about the letters that are written to Timothy is that they are written in a time of Paul's life and ministry that he recognizes are the twilight years. Not twilight years so much because of his failing health or because of his inability to do ministry any longer, but twilight years because he knows that his days are numbered, that his days on this earth are going to be cut short because he's about to be put to death for the faith, murdered for the faith. And so there's a tone to the what we call prison epistles that is, I think, abrupt, brief, direct, specific, and there is a seriousness in the understanding of the time is at hand. So here we are in verse 11 of chapter 1. Paul is warned about teaching, charge, charging people at Ephesus that they don't teach a new doctrine. And I'll go into that when we go after we read and pray. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Father, Please help us tonight to be able to comprehend this portion of the Scripture in a way that would enable us to have assurance of our faith and of your desire to save us. And then in a way that would enable us to preach the Gospel to individuals who would think that because of their sin that they're beyond saving. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this letter that Paul writes to Timothy is a charge. And it is one of those, it's not a swan song. Uh, Paul is not writing about himself and about his regrets. He's writing to Timothy, sharing with him the necessity to carry forward, to carry forth. And so in this charge, in this passing of the baton, it's as though Paul has come to the end of his stretch or leg in the race, but he realizes that the race is not over. The race is not finished. And friend, we need to pass on torches and we need to pass on batons until the Lord Jesus comes. That's the mindset of Paul. Paul's mindset is not that, well, it's over because I'm done. Paul's mindset is, now carry on because I'm done, because I'm finished. I've run my race, but now you run yours. And so there's an urgency uh, with Timothy as, as in... Uh, the manner in which Timothy is going to run his race, Paul wants to make sure he runs the race well, wants to make sure he, he uh, is equipped well. You ever watch a relay race? They're fun to watch. And one of the things I love about a relay race is how that at the end of an individual runner's leg of the relay, he begins to just run it out. And while he's running it out, who's running beside him? 
the guy he's about to pass the baton to is running with him and getting his speed up, getting his pace. And while he's setting his pace, then the handoff happens. And then the other guy slows down, but the guy that, that got up to speed is still running. And the beauty of it is that the baton never slows down. And friend, we ought to see the gospel that way. We ought to see the gospel ministry. It is tragic that oftentimes in the twilight years of men's ministry, it's as though they want the ministry to wind down with them instead of spreading to the end and handing off the baton and saying, keep going and go faster. And that's the mindset of what Paul is finishing the race with. He's finishing this race by saying, now Timothy, I want you... I left you at Ephesus, and here's what I want you to do. In uh, verse 3, he said, When I went into Macedonia, I, let you, I had you stay at Ephesus, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than God the edifying which is in faith. So do. He said, I left you here to do this. Do it. And so he's reminding Timothy the charge has not changed. This is no cats away mice play kind of a statement Paul is making here. You know, God help us to have people that say, you know something, our leadership's not here and so I need to step up. And that's Paul's mindset. It's not, well, there's no leadership here. Or they, you know, I'm not going to... No, it's, it's uh, you've got to lead more, Timothy. What I told you to do, it was important, but when I pass off the scene, it'll be that much more vital. And primarily what Paul had left Timothy at Ephesus for the purpose of was to charge them that they not teach contrary doctrine. Think with me of this, if you will. Most of the Scripture, the majority of the Scripture at this point had now been penned. Rather recently, I don't know how circulated the Scripture was, but one of the things Paul wanted Timothy to know was that the passing of the apostles was not licensed to come up with new beliefs. In other words, apostles were foundational gifts to the church. And from people's perspectives, the apostles were giving them the organization, the order, the rules, the way that the church was to be in doctrine and function and purpose. And what Paul is telling Timothy is don't change that. It's not changeable. Again, right here in the beginning of this letter to Timothy is a reference to the authority, the apostolic authority of this letter. Don't change what you've been taught. And that brings us now, if let's jump ahead just a little bit, brings us down to the urgency of the actual message. Paul talks about false teachers as every letter of the New Testament actually does. And then in verse 11... He describes the kind of things that people are saved to. He said, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. He's saying, don't teach anything besides that. In verse 12, he said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And I just love that phrase, putting me into the ministry. That ought to describe each of us in the ministry that God has given us. Um, what do they say? Mama called, Papa sent? About preachers that God hasn't called? Now, there's a lot of mothers that, that uh, pray that their kids will be preachers and they grow up teaching them, you're going to be a preacher. And they, sometimes a son will grow up and just think, well, you know what, I don't want to disappoint Mom. I better go in the ministry. My friend, don't go in the ministry because you're afraid to disappoint Mama. Go into ministry because God put you in it. And those mama sent ones, uh, or pop, mama called papa sent ones, uh, it seems as though they burn out. I will say this though, I think sometimes it's just an excuse for people to quit, to say something like, well, I was never called or whatever. I, I just cannot believe that God has not called more laborers into His harvest, with the harvest being as plenteous as it is. Can you? And so, I don't need to speculate a terrible amount on that because the fact is, is that God has it all handled, taken care of. And He's got my part handled and taken care of. And that's the part I need to be concerned with. And Paul said, I thank God He's enabled me. Enabled me. He's thankful that God enabled him to be faithful to the ministry 
which God put him into. Now, Paul, he was making a very good use of the word, uh, of the idea of the privilege, and that God had counted him faithful. Faithful to what? To be a servant. God counted him faithful to be a servant. You know, an unfaithful servant is a terrible thing. An unfaithful servant is a terrible thing. Particularly in the ministry. When you can't trust a servant, that's a terrible thing. And Paul understood that being a slave, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ was a grand privilege. And he was thankful that God had counted him faithful to do it. And then he emphasizes why it is that he was he believes that it was special for God to have put him in the ministry. And that was because he didn't believe he was worthy. Verse 13, he said, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. And he said, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, friend, let me ask you a question. How many people do things knowingly in unbelief? I understand unbelief is the choice of the will, but if you don't believe, how much of what Paul did because he did not believe in Jesus Christ when he was lost, how much of what Paul did was ignorant when he was in unbelief? 100%. 100%. I've had people say, well, there's the caveat, Pastor. The fact is that some people are in unbelief and they're, they're not ignorant. They know what they're doing when they sin against God. My friend, anyone who is in unbelief is ignorant. That's it. And so when Paul was injurious and a persecutor of the faith, when he was all of these things, he said, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And that's not, he's not couching this in an excuse. He's not talking about, you know, when he said, with zeal I persecuted the church of God. He's not emphasizing, you know, I meant well. He's emphasizing, I'm thankful that God put me into the ministry in spite of the fact that I persecuted Him. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? And from that moment on, God put him in the gospel ministry. God dealt with Paul. Now I want to look at, at more of the emphasis of the gospel here. And he goes on to say in verse 14, he says, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. My friend, if you want to know what grace exceeding, grace abundant is, a great example of it is in God's graciousness to a railing, blaspheming unbeliever. That's the context. The next time you think, man, that guy went too far. He said too much or he did too many things, that lost person. Just remember this. God's grace is exceedingly abundant to those people. That's what Paul said. That's what Paul said. Would anyone have been offended if God sent Paul to hell when he was in unbelief? Would anyone have said, you know something, that was a little bit harsh, God. No, Paul was a little bit harsh. He was just pure evil. Uh, Paul is not using a pretense of humility when he calls himself the chief of sinners. Chief is not, you know, wearing a uh, headdress and, you know, having a tomahawk and leading a powwow or passing the, you know, peace pipe around. That's not what he means by chief. What he means is primary, first, foremost. That's the word chief. Chief is first, foremost, primary. He said, I was the first sinner, the number one sinner. I was the primary sinner. I was the bad guy in town. And he said, that, and this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. And friend, get this tonight, will you? That Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm chief. Paul here mentions two categories of people that Jesus wants to save. He wants to save sinners, and Paul said, and Jesus came to save me. In other words, he says it on a plural and he says it in a singular. I like to put it this way, Jesus died for me. Jesus died for our sin, but Jesus died for my sin. I've said before to individuals, you know something, if you were the only sinner in the world, Jesus would have died for you. Amen. And that's what Paul is emphasizing here. I'm the chief of sinners and Jesus died for me. 
So his salvation became very personal. Friend, sometimes you'll, on occasion, feel a little bit low, particularly when you are not everything you ought to be as a believer. And you'll feel as though, why did Jesus die for me? You know, I think I'm too bad to save. I'm beyond redemption. I should be. Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners and Jesus died for me. That's who Jesus came for me. Came for me. When you meet someone who's lost and they'll say something to you like, you don't know what I've done. You don't know how bad I've been. I think what makes them feel so terrible is that they know that the evil that they've done, they've done knowing it's evil. That's kind of one thing if you just didn't know something was wrong and you did it. It's a whole other thing when you know it's wrong and you just do it because you don't care. Paul said, that was me. Chief of sinners. And he said, Jesus came to die for me. It'd do your heart good to say, Jesus came to die for me. And again, my friend, I'll remind you that God loves you very much. So much so that if you were the chief of sinners, so much so if you were the only sinner, Jesus came to die for you. And when you run into somebody, and you share the gospel with them, and they say something like, I don't think God would save me, or I'm not sure that God could save me, would you show them 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15 and say Jesus came to die for Paul who was a sinner of which he was chief. Okay, so here's the question. Could God save a murderer? Save Paul. Was he a murderer? Yes. Yeah. Could God save a blasphemer? Yes. Was Paul a blasphemer? Yes. Could God save an angry man? Could God save someone who literally was just about as bad as Christians thought bad could be? Yeah. Paul said, Christ died for sinners. <laughs> Christ died for me. I am chief. In many ways, Paul, the way he phrased it, made it sound like this. I'm the best sinner. I'm the person Jesus died the most for. In other words, God loves me very much. Well, there's something about the confidence of a person who knows what they were and knows what they are because of what Jesus has done. There's something about being able to live just knowing that God's love is not conditioned on our worth. Some people in their pride think they're worth quite a bit. Think they deserve God's love. They usually don't think they deserve God's judgment. They're greatly mistaken. Some people, though, are realistic about it. And they recognize that they deserve God's wrath and that they don't deserve God's love, and yet God loves them very much. And there's just something about knowing that God loves me not because of a condition I've met, but God loves me because of the kind of gracious God He is that ought to help you live confidently. You know, there's something about having assurance of your salvation that enables you and equips you to be able to just confidently live. I have to worry about, am I really God's child? You ever watch a kid whose siblings have convinced them that they're adopted? It's kind of funny in our family. Uh, <laughs> I don't look like my mom or dad in particular either. I kind of look like them, but I kind of don't. My mom says that I look like her dad. My uh, grandma says I look like her brother. Her dad and her brother were dead before I was ever born, so I've never seen them. So I don't really look like my dad. I don't really look like my mom. My mom and dad are shorter than I am. Uh, my mom's very blonde, very German looking. And my dad is uh, very, I guess, French, Dutch, something looking. Um, and uh, I don't know what he is. Pennsylvania Dutch. Prices are Dutch, mostly. Except for some Swedish, some Jewish some other things. But I don't look too much like either of them. 
But I convinced my brother, who's a spitting image of my mom, that he was adopted. <laughs> I read in a comic book, it was actually Calvin and Hobbes, where uh, Hobbes had convinced Calvin that his parents bought him at a flea market for five cents. <laughs> And so I convinced my brother that mom and dad purchased him, which he should have been honored that they spent something for him. <laughs> you know, rather than got paid to take him. But I think it was my sister and I, but we convinced my brother for a brief amount of time that he was adopted. I think it made him cry. <laughs> Not 27. I don't remember. Probably like 8, 9, 10, somewhere in there. Old enough to read Calvin and Hobbes. Old enough, he, old enough for him to be young enough to believe us. Um, <laughs> it's a problem we teach kids to read, they get ideas. <laughs> now watch what your kids read. <laughs> There's something about wondering if you're legitimately your parent's child. Isn't there? But the deal is, what you're questioning is their love. Whether they really love you. And the reality of it is, is that an adopted child is actually loved more deliberately uh, than a child who is natural natural born to his parents. Parents have to make a decision to adopt a child. And God's love for sinners particularly is a demonstration of love. Because it's entirely without consideration of merit or worthiness. God doesn't love you because He should. He loves you because that's the way He is. And I'm glad he doesn't love me because he should, because there will be times when he shouldn't. I'd a lot rather God just love me because he's love. And that's the way he is. Because, see, that's a condition that will not change on the basis of what I am. And you can just rest in that. Sometimes I've heard adults not being careful speak to other adults or children and question their salvation because of their behavior. You know, you acted up, so I don't know if you're really God's child. How could you do that and be saved? I question their understanding of the gospel if they think that behavior has anything to do with God's love. If you've received Jesus as your Savior, you've received God's love. You've taken it, you've accepted God's love, so you're born again. And it's not conditioned on whether you're a good sinner or a bad one. And of course, that's a sarcastic line. There aren't good sinners and bad ones. Paul just said, I was numero uno. Sinero. I don't know what the word Hamartia. No, what's the word for sin in, in Spanish? Huh? Yeah, I know Hamartia is in uh, Greek. Yeah, what? Avocados. Yeah. Avocados. Avocados. God. Muy bad. El bado. El much el bado. God loves you. God loves you. And God loves you so much, it'll never change. And so you can rest confidently in that. And you ought to live for Jesus. You ought to feel the urgency to love one who loves you out of his gracious, holy character. And not to condition a God who loves without condition. You know, I preach the gospel of people the same way. I don't know you. I don't know what kind of a sinner you are. But I know what a Savior He is. Right? He loves the chief of sinners. And He loves me. He might love you. He loves you. It's great, isn't it? Hope you can rest in God's love this week. Father, thank You for the love of Jesus. And I pray that You would help us to be confident about that, to be assured about it, so we can move forward into asking the next question, which is, what should I do?
with the ministry that God has counted me faithful and put me into. Thank you for this. We thank you because of Jesus. Amen. Don't forget about um, music practice. Four minutes music practice up front.